So, um, this evening I'm speaking of hair and uh, about the ways in which Renaissance artists such as Leonardo da Vinci and Sandro Botticelli painted fabulous hairstyles uh, as a way to make you fall in love with the people they represented. Still, I must confess from the very beginning that uh, as an Italian, I'm very ill-suited to speak of hair as I can hardly pronounce the word in English. <laughs> and uh, sometimes in my mouth I make uh, makes hair become a female pronoun. <laughs> Sometimes listeners think I'm referring to a, the beneficiary of an inheritance <laughs> because the tip of my tongue can hardly take the trip of three steps that leads to Lolita, but it certainly refuses to fall to the lower row of my teeth to let my inner air become hair. So, but my, my vocal difficulties though have a great benefit uh, because they opacify a term that often goes unnoticed they turn into an obstacle and, uh, and they make me search for alternatives. Uh, so how can I avoid saying that word? Uh, you know, what can I substitute it with? Uh, because what is similar to hair? So, and such questions are not driven by fear of failure and rather they are pressed by my, my research on Renaissance painting. Those representations of mythical goddesses whose manes are blown by the wind or those portraits of impeccably quaffed ladies where each strand is painted very, very carefully. When I look at them, I cannot help but marvel at the labor that artists put in their hairstyles. Those heads are clusters of minutely rendered strands. And it's not only about execution, it is about construction too. Painters approached headgears with tremendous structural awareness. Artists spent a huge amount of time thinking about headgear. Look at this famous Madonna by the Florentine painter Filippo Lippi. Her tresses tied in a ribbon, coiled on the top of her head, are covered not by not one, but two veils. The light, diaphanous one falls over her ears and shoulders, folded in the neckline of her dress. The second of a slightly heavier cloth is instead tucked under the tail coiled at the top, falling um, on each side into tiers of pleats that keep their shape, thanks to the ribbons dotted with pearls that fasten them. <coughs> My description could become more and more precise. Uh, you can see that I've left many things behind uh, because there's a lot to see in this portion of the painting as there's a lot of labor that has been put into it. The time painters spend laboring over here is well documented. When a young Florentine boy entered a painter's studio as an assistant, he was taught about how to paint by drawing the coiffures made by his master. Or at least this is what an artist such as Verrocchio, probably the greatest artist of 1470s Florence, was said to have done. Among Verrocchio's pupils was one boy who became Leonardo da Vinci. And the source of this piece of information about like being trained by painting hairstyles is another painter, Giorgio Vasari, who ended up owning some of Leonardo's efforts on that front uh, so that he knew what he was talking about. So Verrocchio gave his pupils drawings such as this well coiffed head of a woman, which is today in the British Museum in London. This drawing is an exercise in the intensile nature of hair, with a fringe loosely while her fringe loosely falls over her temples, the hair on the top of her head is gathered into two braids, which after a double loop on each side join in the center, fastened by a jewel. Its spiraling coils are closely mirrored by Leonardo's Munich's Madonna, among the earliest paintings he made. Another drawing of a striking head by Verrocchio is in the collection of Christ Church College in Oxford and shows carefully pricking around her hair and the silhouette of her braids. It is not just the outline of her face or their neck, as you can see on the right, that are being carefully transferred from paper to painting, but also her hairstyle, as you can see on the left. Leonardo employed the same technique in his portrait of Ginevra de Benci, which you can see at the National Gallery in Washington. Infrared reflectography has revealed dotting all around her hair. Leonardo continued training, making her style for the rest of his life. Even when in 1482 he left Florence and moved to Milan, he brought with him some of the beautiful hairstyles that he had sketched uh, while he was an apprentice in Florence. 
So it must have been impossible for young artists to go through Verrocchio's workshop without trying their ha hands at hairstyling. In his uh, Karlsruhe uh, Madonna, Lorenzo Di Credi, another assistant, bundles the virgin's hair into two braids that cut across her forehead, a remnant of his training with Verrocchio, and one that would slowly disappear over the years. Biagio d'Antonio, another painter, who remained rather insensitive to the creative potential of hair, produced uh, as an assistant in Verrocchio's workshop in the 1470s, a st study of the ways braids hang on the virgin's temples and under her veil. Additional ver verrocchiesque drawings of complex coiffures have been attributed to Ghirlandaio and Perugino to other assistants. So we have a lot of them. We know that painters were intimately familiar with her styling. Giorgio Vasari, the painter I mentioned before, tells us that Perugino, one of these two assistants, quaffed his wife's hair. He specifies, Vasari specifies that he did so even when she stayed indoors, implying a level of experience that only comes from constant practice. And Ghirlandaio took his nickname from his father, who Vasari reports became famous for making ghirlande, that is, hair bands in metal, such as gold and silver. And these were worn by many fashionistas at the time. Leonardo is known to have designed the most elaborate wigs and headgear for theatrical spectacles in Milan. Such investment in hair explains the quantity and range of painted hairstyles and headdresses in Florence in the 1460s and the 1470s with no real precursor. You can pour through experimentations of representing coiffures in the first half of the 15th century. It is uh, Gentile da Fabriano turbans, Pisanello bundled up hairdos, Donatello soft classicizing curls. And you'll find a very uneven landscape where only a handful of works elevate themselves to the level of her scrutiny that are comparable to those produced a generation later. But when we look at that generation in the 1470s, that is Verrocchio, Alessio Baldoni, Baldovinetti, Pollaiuolo Brothers, and especially Filippo Lippi, they injected into headgears and hairstyles a powerful and sophisticated luxury rarely seen before then. Such a convergence has led scholars to investigate the Florentines' newfound economic disposability. <laughs> so people are saying that more families could afford the riches that were once reserved to a very few. And those including not only dazzling harpins and hairdressers' wages, but also the privilege of seeing the results minutely represented in portraiture. Yet, the drawings of Verrocchio and his pupils occupy quite a different status. Some scholars have emphasized their function as both playful exercises and show off pieces that take the elaborateness of contemporary hair and headgear styles to the extreme, verging towards the abstract. Those scholars have, been labeled, they have labeled such hairstyles as fantasie in Italian, or idealized heads, swapping a sense of veracity for artistic inventiveness. So Verrocchio's head in the British Museum offers a case in point. Let's return to this drawing, which, when flipped, reveals a sketch of the same head, but without hair. The strokes around her cheeks and forehead are brisk. Verrocchio went over the contours more than once, as if trying to get the silhouette right. In some points, the hatching is summary. There's just enough to render the slenderness of the nose and the overall profile. Such hastiness suggests that Verrocchio may have been drawn from a model who, by the way, is not necessarily a woman. It could be a boy. Uh, but that li leaves lots of questions for us. Do the longer strokes that you can see on the left uh, suggest that the model supported her, her or his head with a hand? Maybe the mod model got tired keeping still during the drawing session? It is interesting to, pover, uh, to ponder over the effects of reworking the models here, which was pulled back, as suggested by the curved strokes springing from the forehead, and that became a wonderful coiffure. The turning of the page signals the divisions in work between the drawing from a model <laughs> and the invention of a coiffure. I said that they are the same hat, but they really are not. Such an image implied the existence of two mindsets, one whose goal is speed, and the other one is driven by a process of distillation and exclusion, that is a fantasia. But such a dualism, you know, whether something is truthful or something just invented, uh, 
especially when talking about hair, is insufficiently complex. It is insufficient because it is based on the idea that painting either invents uh, or copies with little wiggle room in between. Art historians claim to be able to decide if those headgears were real or not, whereas when studying the history of hair, that is the cultural norms uh, about their styling and the concepts that were employed to speak about it, uh, I came to the realizations that hair existed in a different ambiguous status. And this is this sense of mystery and ambiguity that I want to emphasize this evening. So in the second half of the 15th century, her styles became to be seen as lingering at the thresholds of truth and fiction because of a number of cultural processes that constructed hair as dead matter and yet growing to some supple and yet independent. Hair articulated the limit between three, stillness and animation, decency and indecency, that is four. It extended outside of the body, linking it to its surrounding and wider environment. Hair even came to be seen as something that does not belong to you, even if it grows out of you. So this is the crucial point, you know. Hair is weird, okay, in the Renaissance. The 15th century conceptualization of hair as in between found its main site of elaboration in domestic spaces. Florentines first, uh, first of all, learn about hair at home. From a young age, they were told to spend time combing it, and it is important to say the 15th century combs were cleaning devices. Now, what you see on the screen is something special. It's a luxury ivory comb from the Medici collection, so these people have money, right? So, the fine teeth at the top serve to remove a fleas. The activities of combing, brushing, and vigorous scrubbing are included in many books of medicine and natural history as a healing cure. You don't bath, you just scrub yourself the whole time. But it was not just fleas and bugs that needed to be removed. Hair was thought to be ontologically dirty, as doctors and physicians often describe it as an excrement. Hair was not like excrement, hair was excrement. It was thought as the residue of the secretion of phlegm through skin pores, and as secretion, it was similar to feces, tears, mucus, and blood. It is not by chance that hair was painted like tears and blood in this painting of a sorrowful Christ by the Flemish painter Hans Memling, and it made a sensation when he arrived in late 15th century in Florence. And on the right is a copy by Ghirlandaio here in Philadelphia. The watery filaments of tears are painted with like the loose hair curls or the dripping of blood because the three were thought to be physiologically one. Hair was particularly close to mucus uh, as the two were made of dried up phlegm, a substance released from the brain. Aristotle explained that the body naturally purged phlegm not only through the brains, but also through other glands. So if you look at the right, you can see there are many, um, so look at the right. So many glands could be found under the skin, which explained, um, but because the brain was the biggest one, that explained why the head was the most hirsute spot. So what happens is phlegm is a natural vapor that comes out of the brain, and then it goes through the skin. When it gets in contact with hair, it dries up, and that's how hair is formed. That's how they thought hair was formed, right? So it's like growing dead matter, and it keeps growing because the vapor from the brain through the kind of intellectual activities keep be being produced, right? So. That's what happened. And on the left, instead, you see a famous drawing by Leonardo da Vinci that shows, that shows the sections of the human head. You can see hair curls like growing on the top, right? So, as something that was released by inner organs, hair was thus an indicator of someone's inner well being. It reveals how well the organs functioned and overall the nature and the character of a person. Rough, coarse hair, for instance, denoted a formidable production of heat, which is typical of the bestial people of Northern Europe. Whereas long, 
fast growing wavy hair was a feature of women who were naturally rich in phlegm and humidity, right? So the appearance of hair served as a both a gender differential and as a sign of sexual activity. To look at hair was a way to grasp someone's personality and moral standards. Uh, and in pre-modern Italy, love was mostly directed at virtues. And to detect virtue, people carefully look at people's hair. So it's like looking at shoes today, basically. <laughs> they did so following the advice of the great medieval intellectual Al Albert the Great, who wrote that bushy people and those sporting beards were sexually inactive. Okay, so the opposite of hipsters. So th those who were sexually active instead dried up the inner fluids, you know, because they have so much sex, uh, for instance, <laughs> and, uh, and therefore they killed the body's internal environment for the generations of hair, right? So a woman with long hair thus had to have long, you know, had to be chaste, right? Long hair means moral virtue, okay? On the other hand, energetic soldiers and active warriors had to be bold, right? As did elderly people whose low productions of bodily fluids cooled down their constitutions, making them lose hair like trees shed leaves in winter. So, Marcillo Ficino, this famous philosopher <coughs> working in Florence, thought along an analogous lines when talking hair to explain the humoral circulations on which the health of the world depends. This is a passage for one of his treatises. It says, life is infinite in all the world's things uh, and can be clearly seen in trees and grass which are like the world's hair and body hair. The coupling of hair and excrement returning the tax of preachers in a sermon by Giordano da Pisa, a very famous friar at the time, a sort of like national celebrity in 14th century Italy, when speaking in front of a large audience in Florence, he put in his fingers a woman's heads, and he writes, one woman will put 100 florins worth of gold on her head for decoration's sake. What is this? You know, and the poor don't even have clothes to cover themselves, nor anything to eat, while that sack of dung holds 100 or 200 gold florins on her head in ornamentation. And the lacking husbands consent to it, and they lose their soul too. They should make laws and proclamations about such vanity. If they were the sort of man they ought to be, do not marvel if the superfluities in which women are engaging are the reasons for the destructions of this city, because God abominates and holds contemptible excesses and superfluities. There's a lot to unpack in this passage. For instance, the portrayal of husbands as victims, you know, hairstyles and headgears as leading to perdition, and volum voluminous coals of hair compared to the feces, but we know where it's coming from, right? Florentines, st um, you know, G but Giordano's vocabulary is not just provocative and graphic. It is actually theologically orthodox. It comes straight from Thomas Aquinas, the intellectual guide of the Dominicans, that is Giordano, this friar's orders, but is also one of the greatest theologians of the Middle Ages. It is uh, Thomas Aquinas who included here among the superfluitas, you know, a Latin label that is stuck to all things that we would leave behind on Judgment Day, okay, such as blood, such as tears, such as phlegm, such as feces, right? He writes, you see, and this is not, the Summa's theology from which I'm quoting is not a, margi a marginal work, it's the most important theological work from the Middle Ages, okay? And he writes, you see, hair and nails do not resurrect in the human body. Like uh, urine and sweat and feces and other superfluities, hair and nails are generated by excess of food. And as those do not resurrect, so neither do hair and nails. So by growing after death, hair showed itself to be deadly. The constant humdrum of hair as superfluitas uh, ties the 14th to the 15th centuries into a rather compact phase of hair chastising. The great preacher Bernardino of Siena transcribed Giordano's sermons, the one we just heard, in a little book he brought literally everywhere and drew from it while composing his own sermons, uh, and which often attacked 
people who excessively cared for hair. He lambasted their dying as an act of vanity. He railed at the commerce of extensions, which he denigrated as the hair of the corpses. And it's just not a made up expression. Again, you know where this is coming from. It's coming directly from his theological education. So did many other famous preachers, for instance, Giovanni da Capistrano, or another preacher, Bernardino da Feltre, who publicly burned hair extensions and false beards as signs of arrogance? since the wearers thought they could improve God's creation. So Girolamo Savonarola, the Dominican friar who, who pushed Florentines to burn wigs and headpieces in his bonfires of vanities, scolded mothers for adorning their daughter's head with many superfluous hairstyles. Oh wait, what's happening? This is the wrong quote, I'm sorry. Uh, with many superfluous hairstyles, and the Italians read superfluita cappellatura. And it was 1494, Verrocchio had died seven years before, okay? Botticelli was still alive and working in Florence. Leonardo is in Milan, okay? But Thomas Aquinas' 13th century vocabulary was still perfectly current, okay? So preachers did not simply chant the order's norms from the pulpit, but actively worked them through political institutions. So when Giordano da Pisa go lamented that governors should make laws and proclamations about such vanity if they were the sort of man they ought to be, he was claiming an impotence that was either rhetorical or circumstantial. In fact, we have many, many documents that show that religious orders were intensely involved in the policing of her styling. In 1355, just to give an example, the city of Florence inaugurated a taxation of women for wearing guirlande, this garland, which was still valid when Botticelli's career shoot off. And ranging from two to 10 Florence, the tax was to be paid to one of the friars who worked for the Camera dell'Arma, which is an institution that collected taxes on weapons. So if you, if you wanna wear your tiaras, you better pay your taxes, okay? The same entangling of civic and religious hair policing is evident elsewhere. By the middle of the 15th century, the bans on luxury voiced by Franciscan preachers, Giacomo della Marca, has shaped legislation in Terni, Recanati, and Fermo, that you see here on the screen, which, pr which produced distinctive laws. In 1471, Venice, a consortium of 12 women sent a petition in favor of wearing hair extensions directly to the Pope. And in Florence, sumptuary norms were mostly directed at goldsmiths whose guild, the so-called Arte di Santa Maria, also included the Ghirlandai, that is artisans who, besides making tiaras and metallic headbands, also worked as hairdressers. Verrocchio started his career as a goldsmith before registering as a painter and training all these famous artists. But Botticelli was the brother of a bachelor who's also a gold beater, that is a goldsmith, right? So in a way, the coiffures that Verrocchi and Botticelli invented sublimated the political bands and religious castigations of hair adornment, taking their intense scrutiny to the artistic arena. So the painting something is almost impossible to make, to see in the streets, right? So let's sum up, okay? Doctors of hair as an excrement and as something that stemming, stemming from inside the body revealed your inner functioning like a litmu litmus test. Preachers agreed, they may have called hair a superfluity, but also regarded it as disclosing generally a person's inner attitude, and more precisely, that person's moral standards. Doctors and friars, and maybe worth pointing out that most doctors wear friars, okay, presented hair as a problem. Okay? They insisted that it constituted not only a hygienic and moral issue, but also a visual hazard, and asked politicians to regulate its appearance. Regardless of the directions one turned to 15th century Florence, hair was seen as a menace. Something to be mindful of and something to, talk, to constantly take care of. Which explains the other side of the comb. Well, as we saw, the top row served to remove fleas. The bottom row of wider teeth was for partitioning the wild mass of hair into manageable strands, which could then be braided or styled. In other words, the calm was an invitation to action, to do something about your hair, turning excrement into a disciplined mass that would reveal both your industry and your status. 
In light of the discourses that we have exposed, it is difficult not to see braiding and styling as political gesture. When a woman pulled her hair into a tail, when she called it around her head, she aligned her body to the political diktats of the time, thus becoming both a subject of, sub of social norms and a vehicle for their propagation. Refusing to braid your hair, at least for women, but, but there were norms for men too, meant to let your barbaric animal state out. Letting your hair grow or refusing to wax your body with hot irons compromised the visual social order in which your community found its strength. Combing, braiding, and styling were a daily reaction to the natural disorder of the world and in which hair participated. Through its incessant nocturnal growth and the facility by which it slipped out of the grip of pins and ribbons, hair represented the danger of a world that constantly collapses on itself, giving ways to chaos. I know it sounds overdramatic, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so while styling hair, women also shun excess. Francesco de Barberino explained in his book on manners for women, this is a didactic educational book, that hairstyling needed to reveal the teachings of temperance. Hairstyling was more likely to be tolerated if it stayed within the middle ground of decency. His recipes, built on negatives, cast hair as something wild and in need of control. Hair should not be washed too often, he wrote, nor too seldom. You should not have too many extensions. You should not be constantly covered, give hair some air. His search for the means leads to an equation with its moralizing character. Francesco concludes by saying that women is to hair ornament as the deers to the fountain, which sounds cryptic, right? But it's actually a Christological um, uh, reference to the figure of the deer, whose pelt grows anew after drinking from the spring of life. Francesco here, in other words, is saying that hair tummy could become a way to salvation. So imagine growing up in this environment with people telling you that this is growing out of your head, this is excrement, and you should constantly comb it and remove the fleas uh, and treat and braid it because otherwise you're just an animal, right? And you hear this for decades, right? And then you start telling your daughters and so on. You're totally ingrained in this part of society, right? So you believe it. <laughs> so many of the scenes carved on the ivory combs they were so popular in Botticelli's and Leonardo's times, were advertisements for moderations. Scholars have considered them in relation to the amorous game, the combing and her styling anticipated, the meetings with abiding husbands or passionate lovers, even imaginary ones. But more often than not, uh, however, these stories repre you know, are represented by those of Bathsheba, Suzanne and the Elders, or the Judgment of Paris. The tease, these are cautionary tales. The worn the warned comb users against the excesses of beautification. <coughs> For instance, take this comb from the Victor and Albert Museum in London. Okay? We see Bathsheba bathing and David on the left, on the top of the tower, right? That is telling a page to bring her a message. The story starts as a flirt, but everyone knew it ended up in tragedy. Listen. But Sheba's unsheltered toilette was inconsiderate and aroused King David's lust, leading to adultery, the death of her husband in battle, and eventually the killing of their illegitimate child. You got this scene represented in your daily comp, right? So the story was not amorous, but it was a means to raise social awareness. If the wider teeth served as an invitation to sell your hair, to turn excrement into a sign of virtuous temperance, the stories of Bathsheba set the limits to your zeal. Don't exceed in beautification, right? Don't make kings fall in love with you, right? Because this is what may happen, right? Your imaginary legitimate child may die, right? So, like Francesco Barberino's manual, the story served to tell you when to stop. Far from being a simple object for beautification, the comb is a, is a complex machine for physical and moral cleansing. And through such cleansing, the comb turns a superfluity into a useful cog of the civic machine. So if artistry, though, has remained completely blind to the political eff uh, you know, effects of comms, it is because artistry 
has largely benefited from a particular take on hair. In art history, hair is the staff of connoisseurship, which means, which is the sub-branch made by researchers who approach artworks to identify the author and the dating. So these people are interested in when something was made and by whom, right? Connoisseurship is an activity fueled by uh, auction houses and commercial galleries. Its, tec uh, its techniques for attributions have been defined in the 19th century and carry with the within them many of the moralisms that in, that in those centuries continue the discourses that we have seen. So those things did not die out in the 15th century. They continue. They're still within us, actually. So one of the fathers of connoisseurship was an Italian called Giovanni Morelli, who taught his readers and his students to look at curls and strands to attribute and date a painting. It is by looking at the shape of the curls of this drawing that, for instance, he attributed it to Verrocchio. Okay. Morelli surmised, surmised that artists were uninterested in hairstyling, which for him was necessarily a feminine activity, and thus executed hair mechanically, similarly to the ways they painted earlobes and fingernails. So while discounted such marginal automatisms from a creative vo uh, viewpoint, Morelli revalued them as offering privileged ways to detect a painter's hand. Main figures give away little in this respect, as their execution is sustained by such high levels of attention. When painting them, the artist's hand is controlled and his eyes scrutinize each stroke. In those areas, a competent artist can disguise his style to the point of indecipherability. But when painting hair, Morelli thought the artist's eyes relax and his hands follow into routine patterns because he doesn't care about hair, right? So he just paints them mechanically, right, as they go, always in the same way. And because he paints them in this kind of mechanic way, and because they kind of like, for him, hair is creating nothingness, you know, hair guarantees the cracking down upon an artist's mysterious identity, right? So the opposite. He knows nothing was going on, hair styling in the 15th century. Raised a Calvinist, Morelli assumed that hair is insignificant, and such an assumption uh, belies this kind of macho Christian prejudice of hair as a girlish superfluity. His approach was taken seriously as it aligned art history with other pseudo-scientific endeavors, such as ethnographers' classifications of races through hair and this famous Italian Carlo Lombroso's tricological taxonomies of criminals. And yet, Although Morelli's biases have long been exposed, many connoisseurs still today, in 2019, continue to search for clues in hair. It was just called uh, by someone to um, you know, uh, classify Leonardo just based on hair, right? The drawing of a hand, for instance, this method, for instance, is at the core of the attributions of the drawings to the young Leonardo. Uh, the drawing of a head in the Louvre on the left is sometimes attributed to the young Leonardo because the lady's hair is close to that of the head of, of, the, head of the Uffizi that you see on the right. I mention Leonardo because his production is exemplary of art historians' ambivalence towards hair. Pressed by connoisseurs to keep considering hair as a marginal element, useful for attribution but not worth exploring further, right? It's sort of like secret among connoisseurs. Art historians have interpreted the attention that an artist bestows on hair as indicative of his lack of maturity. So at the start of his, ca of his career, Leonardo painted a, a great deal of hair. For instance, his, his hair is first recognized in the tears of dangling hair that make the Bolognese terrier of this painting, the London Raphael Tobias, and also the golden curls of an angel here in the Uffizi Baptism of Christ. So that's how you Leonardo started, by painting hair, right? As we know, because that's what you learn in a workshop. But, uh, but then the mature Leonardo da Vinci, when he becomes this viral figure, uh, he's completely uninteresting in hair, or so we are told. Uh, much of his identity as a genius rests on a gallery of artworks in which hair is either absent or completely undetermined. Bernard Berenson, for instance, declared that this one is the finest achievement of all drummanships of all times, and one that gives me the greatest pleasure, because it has no hair. <laughs> and, and then, and, uh, and Berenson was an admirer of Morelli, right? Leonardo is often repeated, was not interested in ornamental frills, instead is engaged in muscular emotions, as proved by these bold, screaming soldiers of the Battle of Anghiari that is today in Budapest. 
So such a virile approach also returns where depicting women. For instance, the lady with her mind, by Leonardo da Vinci, you know, whose hair stretched over her cheeks like a chin mask. The Mona Lisa, in which her hair forms a dark halo from which the face emerges as if, as if from a cavernous hole. But the other Mon Mona Lisa with knotted up braids, uh, you know, this is in the Musée Condé, give, gives away a preciousness that qualifies her a second string. So many people don't believe it can be by Leonardo because it's too decorative, right? So people cast doubts about this, whether it's a genuine work by Leonardo. So Connoisseur's utilitarian take on hair has thus been decisive in shaping our sense of judgment. We still are a gendered bias about these pictures because connoisseurship has been a gendered activity since the 19th century and still today. This is especially important in relation to painters such as Botticelli, who rose to the stardom in the 1470s by transforming hair into the main locus of pictorial prowess. So on the screen now you see a detail of fortitude, part of a series of servant virtues that originally hung in the court of the Mercancia, the powerful guild of Florentine merchants. The building today is in the Gucci Museum, since you're interested in fashion, whereas the series of virtues is displayed in the Uffizi. The painting is often recorded for being the first painting by Botticelli as an independent master. We know little about his training before them, but we do know, however, that he spent time copying the headgears of Lippi's Madonnas, and it is from this contact with Lippi that he may have developed his sensitivity to hair, as reflected in his fortitude, which has a most intricate hair style. Um, her hair is held by a winged coronet and is dotted with pearls of fabulous size, and which were outlaw at the time. Fortitude's hair is both erudite and daring. Her long braids alluded to Roman's cariatid's plates, while her hair joining at the chest refers to the Uffizi Madonna by Lippi that we've seen before. This panel is often disc discussed as part of a scandal. Indeed, the commissions of servant virtues had originally been awarded to Piero Pollaiuolo, who had already presented the first panel of charity when Botticelli painted Fortitude. So Botticelli, so this is the first panel that was presented, but then Botticelli snapped snap up the commission for one of the panels as he could count on the help of a friend, Tommaso Soderini, that was one of the Mercancia commissioners. Yet his intrusions uh, was seen for, you know, his intrusion was in what it was, which is a breach of the contract, and the Guild of Florentine Painters then amended the statutes uh, to protect its mem members from similar cases in the, in the future. So there's a big legal case about these paintings, right? The damage, however, was done, and Botticelli's painting was too precious to be destroyed, and to save face, uh, Polaiuolo had to produce works that matched uh, Botticelli's quality. And it is from a string of paintings that were produced afterwards that we realize Botticelli's fortitude must have been praised also because of her hair style. The next panel in the, pa in the, um, in the series made by, which is Prudence, has this amazingly intricate coiffure. From the central parting, her locks become progressively longer and after this kind of tidally line along her ears, gathering two braids, they join in an ample fold behind her neck. The roots are fastened by a transparent veil that draped over her head, hangs between two golden brooches. Piero Polawolo, or probably his more skilled brother Antonio, who came to the rescue given the crisis, right? I mean, he, he has to win the commission back. He even includes a mirror, you can see here, with the diaphanous reflections on the coiffure side. So you can see both, you know, both sides of the coiffure, right? Prudence pensive eyes look away, but the mirror she holds brings us back to her head. The snake too, you know, with its twisting movements, becomes a key to interpret the hairstyle. It becomes a marker of bravado, showing off the painter's skills at torsions, which is what his hairstyle is about. In Prudence, the veil spiraling around the golden brooches mimics the saggy hammock-like band between the volutes of a ionic capital giving the virtue figure the solidity of a cariatid. Polaiuolo must have taken the idea from Vitruvius, whose treatise on architecture described capitals as carved after women's hairstyles, in a quote. On the right and on the left of the capital, Vitruvius writes, the Ionians place volutes that look like hanging hair curls. 
They also decorated the front with inward looking volutes and festoons, so as to simulate coiffures. So the Polaiuolo brothers thus invoked one of the reference books of their time and lifted the level of the competitions. Botticelli can make great coiffures, we make great learned coiffures, right? So the headgears of the virtues were just not only stupendous, were also literate, erudite, intellectual, right? You have to know this quote in order to decode them. And such a shift must have met the jury's favor, as the headgears of the order of virtues also looted to architectural elements. For instance, look at Justice, here with a sword, her, her curls in volutes that support a turban-shaped abacus, this, the, which is the slab between a capital and architrave. Piero, as it is certainly Piero who painted this time, not the good Antonio, you know, even went as far as using a type of hairpin known in Florence as Borchetta da Testa to simulate this floss abaci, which in Latin means the flower of the abacus. You see the petals, the look made of pearls? That's an um, architectural element, right? And you find them, in fact, in Corinthian capitals. For instance, it may have been inspired by this capital that is in a church in Florence called San Miniato. Okay. And this is returns in all the other virtues. I'm just showing you a few. So it is possible that such a battle of coiffures spurred Verrocchio to make his pupils train a drawing hair, as we've seen in uh, Botticelli and Leonardo's for the rest of their career, right? So this competition is 1470. Leonardo at the time is a, is a pupil. Everyone knows about his legal case. Uh, they understand the hair is so important. Verrocchio says, okay, that's how we're gonna train our our assistants, right? By making everyone paint hair because this has become the new paragon for judging skill in painting. Right. So, and we know for instance that Botticelli becomes a master of her styling. For instance, in 1475 for a joust, Botticelli painted the goddess Athena on a banner which made an, an eyewitness marvel at the ways, and I quote, her hair was all braided and moved in the wind. So people take notice. And in his birth of Venus, both the goddess's magnetic allure and inexhaustible generative capacity are com communicated through her luxurian mane alone. Venus' hair takes center stage. I will now say that its size is incredible. Actually, I bet many Florentines women had their length. <laughs> I've never encountered a source where they say women ever cut their hair, ever, you know, so they would just grow it for the rest of their lives. And uh, unless they enter a monastery, right? But what makes Venus's hair tantalizing is the fact that it is loose. The hair, hair was in Florence was always manipulated, pressed, constrained, even when bathing. The prodigious looseness of Venus's long mane indicates an excessive production of moisture. She's just born, and yet she's the most fertile of creatures. Botticelli was perfectly aware of her Stalin's capacity to charm. Around the time Savonarola burned her extensions, we heard it before, Botticelli painted this calumny of Apelles as a scene of defamation in which her dressing is a metaphor for deception. So, two women are adorning the head of a petitioner in the hope that her attractiveness will sway the ruler to judge her favorably, while naked truth the petitioner's doppelganger sends out, uh, of, um, sends out of the ruler's sight with loose, unadorned tresses. Uh, the gaze of the ruler cannot go, go through um, the doppelganger's hair because the work and um, the hair of the first person here works as an act, it catches the gaze, right? And if it does so, it is because, uh, you know, the two women are styling it. So that's what's happening. This is showing a scene of her styling, a strapping as man's gaze, and the four kind of keeping him away from truth. And if this scene makes sense in 1490s Florence, it's because every poet, every writer was writing about how hair was powerful to fall in love with love, uh, to fall in love. Historians have remarked that the attention to hair is a classicizing gesture. They point to Ovid, who in his poem, The Fast, applauded women's labor in her styling, which he reminded men to praise. <coughs> and in the Metamorphosis, Ovid also talks about how hair becomes leaves and snakes and tears. It falls down and curls up in the blink of an eye. And um, 
So there's a lot of attention in classical poems about here. But the best classical poem to understand here is An Order Metamorphosis by Apuleius, uh, and it's sometimes called The Golden Ass. And there, The Golden Ass narrates the travels of a man that is obsessed with women's hair. In book two, he spends numerous paragraphs describing the voluptuous hair of the slave Fotis, uh, whom the protagonist tries to seduce and who accidentally turns him into a hairy ass. His reasoning is that the women's hair provide the first and the ultimate delight. This is the passage. My first delight has also been, why speak of anything else, the hair on a woman's head, to consider it carefully, first in public and then enjoy it later at home. The reason behind this preference of mine is perfectly well considered. This is the author speaking to the reader, right? Namely, that as the main part of the body openly, clearly seen, is the first thing to meet the eyes. And then what, and then what gaily um, colored clothes do for the rest of the person, it's so natural beauty does for the head. It then concludes that when women wish to prove their true loveliness, they remove their dresses, uh, letting their hair do the talking. While quotes such as these were well known uh, at the time, I want to quote uh, a reworking of this classical text by the famous Italian poet Boccaccio. And this is a text that is called The Commedia delle Ninfe Fiorentine, even if it's often uh, more famously known um, by the name of the protagonist called Ameto. This is a poem that was extremely well known in 15th century and it dramatizes the pleasure of looking at here. The Commedia delle Ninfe Fiorentine is a poem about the transformative power of love. It tells the story of this huntsman, Ameto, who discovers by chance a band of nymphs who teach him the way of love. As a way of illustration, I'll show you a bird tray that is today in New York, but was made of Florence in the 1410s that illustrates the beginning of the tale when Ameto, coming in from the right, sees the nymphs around the fountain. The story, however, is ultimately also an allegorical discourse on virtuous life, while showing how love can transform a graceless hunter into a noble being, it also argues that the soul can acquire the virtues. Each of the seven young nymphs uh, into whose company Ameto is introduced corresponds to a virtue. But Ameto eventually falls in love with only one of them, whose name is Leah, who embodies the values of faith. She appears after Ameto has overheard a song in the woods, uh, and he sees her through the trunks of a tree catches a, gl a glimpse of her face, of the radiant color of which dawn is painted when Apollo arrives with, with a new day. And immediately notices her blonde hair with charming curls falling over her white shoulders, fastened by a lush garland, which he can discern as made out of oak leaves and acorns. And while contemplating her without averting his gaze, he praises her to himself. So the comedy starts as a reflection on the powers of absent-mindedness. As the appearance of every new nymph, a mate is less interested in their tale than looking at her. Boccaccio says that plainly. He says, he enjoys training his eye no less than his hearing and takes from the song what he can without ever averting his gaze from the newcomers, right? It's like, you more interesting in my sweater than you know, in, in what I'm saying. And Amedo has a specific way of looking, a way that always starts from hair, hair. This was not Amedo's own peculiarity. It had become a sort of pattern in the 14th century. When composing a laudatio, that is a, a portrait of a human with the goal of praising this person's beauty, writers knew what characteristics they have to speak about. And hair always takes the opening role. So for instance, if you look at uh, the Roman de la Rose, Guillaume de Loris, uh, he starts the descriptions of women from the hair. And, and he talk about for his osier that the cheveux blonde, plus belle corps de femme. But then if you read Mathieu Vendôme, the Ars Vertificatoria, he also starts with the portrait of Helen with the golden hair, and then it proceeds downwards, forehead, eyes, mouth, neck, and bosom. An example of this sort uh, return in many other texts. These were well known in Italian literature. For instance, we know that Boccaccio was uh, very famous with all these treaties because he reworked them in his own uh, poems. Yet, the repetitions of the names and descriptions is actually deceptive. 
Boccaccio provides this kind of like top to bottom pattern, but then it kind of produces slight variations here and there. But it's interesting because he, he kind of, in only one occasion, like he does not put hair at the beginning of the description. I'm just giving you one description, which is Emilia, and I give you the sense of how long he describes the hair. He says, Emilia's hair is longissimi. He says that in part hair is intertwined over the top of her head with a knot made by themselves. But those hair locks that are shorter and not caught in that knot of hair are spread and twisted around the green branches of the laurel garland. Orders are left hanging in the air, moved by it. By falling back on her fair temples and delicate neck, they make her more graceful. The descriptions of hair lead to uh, uh, are reflections, which is very similar to the one we read by Apuleius. Uh, and, the, and then Boccaccio goes on to describe her eyes and her mouth and her neck and the rest of the body. And he thoroughly scans the bodies of the nymph and often lingers over the opening of her clothes onto patches of skin, giving Boccaccio considerable scope for anatomical details and the, ch and the chance to speak of parts of the bodies and so on. Ameto's tactile gaze is obsessive. He captures the tiniest movements of the nymphs in slow motion, such as the lifting of a toe from the ground. And yet, despite exploring the visual pleasures that the company of the nymphs gives him, no other element in the descriptions is as extensive as here. Here takes a huge amount of time. But, uh, and I don't want to go through all these descriptions, but one of the interesting things is that these poems train the eyes of Boccaccio's readers. He told them that they had to pay attention to hair. And not just like, oh, check if this person's got brown hair or, or blonde hair, if they're long or short, but to pay attention to the intricacies of hair, what kind of hair ornament they have, how they respond to the environment, you know? The, the, it has the different terms for the curls, for the way they like uh, the garland sit on the, on the nape, right? And these trained the mindset of the Florentines at the time. So when actually the, these painters could fall back onto these descriptions to nobilitate and to legitimize their own, um, their own descriptions, right? And uh, it's very interesting because Boccaccio explains that this uh, process of seeing the hair is not just like physical, but it's moral. So it, it, it comes up with a lot of different terminologies to substitute the words to see. He never says the word to see. It's never just that passive. It, while looking at here, his intellect leaps. Uh, he discovers the true character of this person. He's reflecting to what he says, and he predisposes his intellect and his souls more than his eyes. These are actually four steps that are important for scholastic thinking. Okay, so the, these are the four steps that you undertake a university for learning, right? Uh, where you first understand, you see something physically, then you appreciate it intellectually, and then eventually you know what it's about. And the funny thing is, it does it that to look at hair. The most, you know, the things that we're so often taught that counts to nothing, it actually predisposes the soul to knowledge. So when artists uh, painting hair, they also think about this kind of moralizing capacity of hair, how hair can uh, finesse your gaze, uh, can uh, sublimate it, transform it, so that you're not paying just attention to fall in love, but actually you're transforming your inner soul uh, and you prepare yourself for a moral appreciation of the sitters, of the person you're looking. And we know that many painters, friends of Botticelli and Leonardo, were friends, uh, were, were reading Boccaccio. And for instance, this is Poliziano, very influential at the time, and he's directly quoting Boccaccio. I read his quote, he says, Locks, he's talking about a woman who everyone's falling in love with and who's, who's dead. So this is an elegy. And he talks about, locks fall gracefully on either side of your face, gracefully bound with golden knots, or loosely blowing in the breezes created by the wings of the frocking cupids, locks curled into thousand ringlets, made comely and vigorous by the morning dew and the aroma of myrrh. And it goes on again. Um, so when Botticelli is actually painting a virtue with his amazing headgear, it's not just because she is a stupendous divine creature that can afford what the Florentines women are not. 
And at the same time, this is not just a painting. It's telling women what to do with their hair is an excrement, right? And therefore, it's a sort of political diktat of what to do with your hair. It's also telling you that by looking at a hairstyle, which is what you, were, you started with, uh, if you read Boccaccio's um, um, novel, you realize that you predisposing your soul for falling in love, not just with yourself, but with the virtue that this person embodies, right? And this is, in a way, that's why painters somehow thought useful to train themselves at hair and thinking about her style. It's a way to transform the soul of the viewers and to make them possible for the greatest um, outcome of all, which is uh, the predisposition to salvation. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So we definitely have time for questions. Um, maybe like a, a first two student questions, and then to the last class in the hall. I know some of y'all have some awesome questions. Let's hear them. I know we never speak about hair, so that's why <laughs> people don't have ready questions. <laughs> Any thoughts? Yeah. I'm sorry, can you speak uh, up a little bit? Are there any like, implications based off of texture of hair, not just like presence? Because I know that like, some people said that they are more hair and they have more virtue, but do like curly versus straight or something? Like, is hair totally yeah, they totally talk about it. They're like a whole list where you can kind of try to recognize yourself. Uh, in both moral treatises and this kind of physiological, well, treatises about physiology and so on. So you can go there and check, oh, damn, I got curly hair. I got, I'm of a devilish nature, right? Uh, so I should do what I can to, you know, to kind of prepare myself, cleanse myself, and so on, so that I can uh, overcome this flow, right? Which does not mean necessarily just styling your hair differently, but it, it mostly means to do some sort of spiritual exercises that are going to kind of compensate uh, for your natural lack, right? Yeah. They also use waxes, they have all, all, all a range of products uh, that can help. Uh, but when they, when they product, put in products, it's not just like, you know, like us, you know, like we're shaving or we're putting hair gel and so on. There's always something about the substances that have been used that somehow he thought to, to work also at a, let's say, spiritual, moral, and abstract level, right? And that's, I think, is a dimension of our life that's completely gone. We just think about these objects as like, like a producing a particular effect, a visual effect, and that's it. Whereas I think what, what's kind of evident in the historical sources of the time, that there's always this kind of like moralizing and defying kind of massaging into your life, uh, right? So that you kind of predispose yourself also at the spiritual level and not just only at a corporeal level. Do you 
you see the same kind of debate, which I guess is where you're taking this, in, in the world of art. So you see, you were saying there's these examples of um, female bodies that represent truth or knowledge. You also have artists then taking the other side because there are other writers of the Renaissance saying that. Is there the other side of the debate of who artists need to doubt that or are hesitant? And if not, do you have a hypothesis of why? Right. Thank you, thank you. Great, so this is a very, very specific question. Okay, and um, so actually for me, the real source of Boccaccio is, uh, yes, biblical sources, Neoplatonism and so on, but it's Cino da Pistoia. It's, uh, for me, it's very clear, like where the references are coming. So we're talking about a specific uh, poetical traditions uh, and they're like uh, historical, uh, um, the historical ground to support uh, um, when w when Boccaccio was in Naples, he read Cino Pistoia, and he before writing this uh, um, Ameto, the Commedia delle Ninfe Fiorentine, he actually experimented with a couple of poems that are part of his uh, youth production, etc. But this is like uh, something like just like for scholars. Uh, when it gets uh, so, the point I'm trying to make about here is like a very very specific one, which is about. 1470, 1478 in Florence, I would say. So there is a, roughly a decade where her styles are like a boom and they're everywhere. Now, a lot of art historians, what they're doing, they're collapsing the whole Renaissance. So for instance, Michelangelo's heads made at the beginning of the 16th century and, and, Bo and Botticelli's head. And they kind of like, they say, oh, look, they're interesting in here for like 30, 40 years. But that's for me, it's crazy. It's like, say, people are interested in uh, here in the 1960s and today, right? Uh, whereas obviously what Michelangelo is doing is doing a revival of some of this Botticelli's idea after a time when her style has been actually been eliminated during the Savonarola period and so on. So, um, so I, I think there's a lot, lot of waves within it, but there's definitely this debate. So for instance, for Michelangelo's all these kind of heads and so on, becomes more about deception, alluring beauty, you know, um, ma magnetic charms uh, and so on. Whereas for me, in, in Botticelli seems to me to use it for this kind of like moralizing, uh, moralizing attitude, which of course is just an interpretation. And, uh, but I think there are these debates. And in fact, I think there are some people that kind of stay away from it, or some people that just like pull, you know, kind of jump into sort of the debate. And Botticelli himself changes. You know, it starts with this kind of amazing voluptuous mains, uh, and then uh, from the mid of the 1490s, kind of like stops. And then uh, um, people talk about it probably at a conversion, uh, like a change of mind, maybe something to do with the fact that uh, the patrons that were paying for his paintings are, kind of gone because with the Medici's after they've been kicked out of Florence. So, so there's a lot of also this kind of political, uh, political ideas, but then it definitely changes. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's important. It's, uh, so there are all these kind of debates. Uh, thank you for the question. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the meaning that was attributed to hair color in the Renaissance, especially because um, as someone who spends a lot more time with literature than art, I've always been struck by the Right. So. Well, I mean, we don't really know how blonde were the right. Italians. We assume that now today all Italians were right. black, but you know, we still remember the Normans, uh, you know, conquered half of Italy. So we have a lot of kind of uh, Northern European blood in Italy, right? And uh, so, so that, um, so that we don't know. But um, the thing is that classically speaking, the blonde is uh, uh, connected to the radiance of light uh, and gold. So Helen of Troy is blonde, uh, and um, I mean, all, 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 all the kind of protagonists of classical epics, uh, you know, the positive ones, they're all blonde, right? Uh, and uh, so Petrarch's Laura follows these kind of conventions and then, uh, and so all the others. So Botticelli automatically falls through. And uh, we know that there's thing. For me, the interesting part though, that something maybe has been said a little bit less than the questions about luminosity, is the fact the blonde is labored, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's something you have to go through. So it's, it's a process of like uh, removing a feature of the hair. It's like, uh, and that's what you want to do with hair. You want to make it go through something, right? You cannot just present it as a sort of natural beauty. You want to twist it, you want to apply, you know, you want to you wanna tie it in a ribbon. You just don't want to keep it as it is, right? Unless you're Venus, right?